from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, investigators release the names of the people they're looking for after alleged abuse at the nation's largest dairy farm. The role trade aid could possibly play in helping farmers with unplanted acres. And all that wet weather now factoring into USDA's forecast for a season that could be one for the record books. Ag Day, presented by the all-new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Corn prices climbing double digits Tuesday following USDA's June crop production report. USDA making a major adjustment to its expectations for the nation's corn crop given the record slow planting pace. Now analysts dropping planted acres by 3 million to 89.8 with yields of 166 bushels per acre. That's well below its previous forecast of 176. On a percentage basis, it's the largest May to June reduction in USDA history. Now if realized, it would be a 13.68 billion bushel crop. But this is a start here and really a big cut for production in, in one report. That's a cut of 9% off of total U.S. corn production. They went from just over 15 billion bushels down to about 13.7 in one report. A lot of traders believe that future cuts could be coming. Now on the bullish side, it looks like USDA will probably be lowering acres yet again. They only dropped them 3 million acres this time around. On the bearish side, though, USDA dropped 1350 out of new crop production as far as million bushels. However, the demand offset was very low, only 425 million bushels for an offset. Typically, they offset about half of a demand decline. So it looks like we'll have some competing stories in the next few weeks on USDA's numbers. Soybeans, however, remaining unchanged in USDA's balance sheet. The agency is still looking for 84.6 million acres of soybeans with 49.5 bushels per acre yield, leaving production at 4.15 billion bushels. USDA did not touch its projection for soybeans uh, production, neither acreage nor yield. Those are probably items that come in future reports as the government knows a little bit more. The markets reacted favorably. The corn market rallied double digits. The soybean market uh, did, did not sell off on, on really a neutral report. So not a bad action at all. And, and uh, finally, uh, some, some tangible evidence from the USDA that we are in fact due for a lighter corn crop this year. USDA also putting out its winter wheat forecast. The 2019 crop pegged at 1.27 billion bushels, up a few ticks from May, but 8% higher than a year ago, and it's forecasting yields of 50.5 bushels per acre. Taking a look at the latest World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, USDA cutting ending corn stalks for new crop, but raising them for old crop. Now it's estimating 2.195 billion bushels of old supply. Corn production forecast to drop, and ending stocks are then projected to drop 810 million bushels to 1.7 billion. Looking over at soybeans, USDA estimates that 1.070 billion bushels of old crop, that's cut by 75 million bushels in projected exports. And while the wet weather has cut into planting, production forecasts remain unchanged at 1.045 billion bushels of new crop. As for wheat, old crop stocks are down 25 million bushels to 1.102 billion. New crop projected at 1.072 billion. That's a 69 million bushels lower. We went from an almost 2.5 billion bushel carryover in corn down to just shy of a 1.7 billion bushel carryover in corn. That's an 810 million bushel reduction in carryover for corn. We went from a very bearish, burdensome situation now to what is a relatively tight situation compared to what we've seen in the last few years. And it also leaves very little room for error in this crop coming up. So on June 11th, we really are going to have to see a great rest of the growing season in order to hit the current USDA numbers. And even some would argue that that acreage number will come down at the end of the month when we look at the planted acreage report. USDA is now announcing it's trying to make a change in the trade aid program as another way to help farmers who have been unable to plant because of the wet weather. Ag Day's Betsy Jibben joins us now with more. Betsy. Clinton, basically USDA is trying to figure out how to get some type of payment to farmers who file prevent plant. Legally, USDA says it cannot offer trade aid on acres that is not planted, but there could be other ways. In the department's question and answer document, it highlights how if farmers choose to plant with a cover crop with the potential to be harvested, 
Because of this year's adverse weather conditions, you may qualify for a minimal amount of the 2019 MFP assistance. USDA highlighting it must be an MFP eligible cover crop. However, economists say the quote, potential to be harvested is key. Here we go a few weeks later, we're getting an announcement that my view should clearly be interpreted as, uh, gosh, we kind of made a mistake. We should have uh, uh, fully decoupled the MFP program from the plant, no plant decision. And if you can plant, what you're going to plant decision. Some of you sent your responses to us on Twitter saying this has just added more confusion to an already stressful spring. Shouldn't they have made the announcement way back in May and not June? And another saying, put the ground to use. We've interviewed livestock producers and dairymen who worry there won't be enough alfalfa hay and silage for feed come fall. Irwin thinks this announcement could potentially help with the forage worry. USDA is also reviewing the November 1st restriction for haying and grazing cover crops on prevent plant acres. Clinton. All right, thanks, Betsy. USDA says more MFP details will be released soon. Now, in the meantime, Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue and President Trump are in Iowa this week touting the implementation of E15 year-round. The president in Council Bluffs visiting an ethanol plant and talking about the EPA finishing a rule allowing E15 year-round. EPA cleared the E15 rule at the end of May, which allows retailers to have the option to sell the blend throughout the whole year. Washington analysts say while the approval is big for the ethanol industry, it's going to take time. It's going to take a, a later rather than now impact for you know year-round E15. That doesn't mean that it, it shouldn't have happened. Uh, this will give a, a series of retail establishments the confidence now uh, to put in those expensive pumps and wells uh, for, for uh, uh, to purchase uh, E15 year-round. It was in Council Bluffs where the president first promised to approve E15 last fall. But not everyone is happy with the year-round E15 rules. Reuters reporting the American fuel and petrochemical manufacturers are suing to block the expanded sales. It claims the move exceeds the administration's authority. AFPM has asked the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia to review the EPA's rule. Now that many people are finally getting a crop in the ground, they can breathe a little while while they wait for things to grow. As meteorologist Mike Hoffman shows us in today's Crop Comments. Mike. Thanks, Clinton. You know, it's in those quiet moments you can find beauty. Check out this video shared on Twitter by Allie Hunter Blair, who lives in Herefordshire in England. That's barley growing. They posted the video with the tweet, quote, I love watching the barley dance in the wind. Almost looks like waves on the ocean. Take a look at the wind speed forecast across this country, the lower 48, kind of windy over the northern plains into parts of New Mexico as we start the day today. Comes even windier over uh, Iowa and some of the surrounding states by this afternoon. That whole system continues to move east, and so we'll begin to see a little bit of a breeze at least uh, across the Great Lakes as we head into tomorrow morning. Heading into the afternoon, that will expand a little bit, and we'll see some uh, wind from Kansas into the southwest as well. I'll have more in your forecast coming up. First, here are some hometown temps. Introducing Farm Journal TV, on demand 24-7, Ag Day. Machinery Repeat TV, U.S. Farm Report on your phone and tablet. Download the Farm Journal TV mobile app today. Happening right now, the search is on for three people charged in an animal cruelty case at Fair Oaks Farms, the nation's largest dairy. The Newton County Sheriff's Office in northern Indiana says they're looking for the following people, 31-year-old Santiago Contreras, 36-year-old Edgar Vasquez and 38-year-old Miguel Navarro Serrano. Investigators say all three are charged with the beating of a vertebrate animal, which is a misdemeanor. The charges come after an animal rights group released video showing workers at the farm kicking and throwing young calves. Now take a look at this. Authorities say a pilot died after a small plane crashed into a grain bin in western Missouri. The Federal Aviation Administration says the Cessna left Vero Beach, Florida and was headed to an airport about 50 miles north of Kansas City when it crashed Monday morning. The pilot was the only person aboard. Federal investigators have not released the cause of that crash. While 2019 planning still isn't done, what about 2020? We start the conversation next in analysis and later meet a man helping save millions from hunger. This year's World Food Prize recipient today in the country. 
Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Report day from USCA sent the market soaring. More on how corn rose double digits from the CME. Now for soybeans, we didn't see the big sweeping changes on production. They let, the USDA left everything on the soybean production unchanged, but they also said that the next three weeks are, are going to be critical for soybeans and there might be some big changes coming down the line. So we'll be watching out for that as well. There is a good possibility that if the current weather forecast verifies, the July report is going to be rather bullish for soybeans. So uh, a lot of interesting things happening here in grains today. A big rip the Band-Aid off report for corn. It, it makes things very interesting going forward. We've got a lot of risk for this growing season, so we will be very sensitive to weather going forward. And wheat really didn't have a whole lot of fireworks on this USDA, USDA report, but it's going to try to follow along with corn. As we saw, the wheat, we increased our feed demand by 50 million bushels, and that's directly coming from higher prices in corn. So keep an eye on that. It's going to be very interesting. Weather is going to be a major feature here this summer for, for the growing season for grains. So keep an eye on that as well. This is Ted Seifert of Zaner Ag Hedge coming to you from the CME floor. Happy Waz Day Tuesday, everybody. Craig Turner, Turner's Take, uh, broke over Daniel's trading our guest today. And, and Craig, I think you're the first one to bring it up to me uh, in 2019. And that's planted acreage numbers for 2020. And, yes. But what you say is it's an interesting conversation already. Yeah, it really is because we know we're going to have some pretty long-term issues with global feed demand, right? Even with, without a U.S.-China trade war, there's still going to be the lingering effects of African swine flu sure. for a couple of years, right? Right. So, and, that, and that's going to really impact the soybean market. So, you know, South America will probably increase production a little bit next year. And you got to think, you know, where does that leave the United States? You know, corn and wheat will still be a viable option. And the, you know, the third one where we're going to see things go on the margins most likely is soybeans. So when you take a look at the you know, soybeans now, do we get everything planted? I mean, if, and also how do things work out with the farm aid, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, and prevent plant and what are the rules and the payouts going to be on that? Because if it's favorable for the farmer to plant this year, we're going to have so much on the soybeans, we could have 800 or a billion bushels, you know, and, we, and if we look at the trends and where supply and demand is going to be for soybeans next year, I mean, we could see soybeans underneath 80 million acres next year. Wow. You know, and we can see corn, you know, get into the mid to high 90s. Right. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if you just look at the trends going forward, you would assume... We're going to be tight in corn this year. Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to probably be heavy in beans. And we're also going to have a pretty, you know, South America will have a lot of acres again. And we're going to probably have less demand for global, global feed. So it just kind of the way it works yeah. out in the math. And, and then you talk, throw on top of that some of the uncertainty around trade and some yeah. of the trade disruption that we've seen. And, and that seems to drive some of these decisions as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if China and the trade war is still going on and they're still doing most of their business with South America and Brazil, um, it does, again, that's just another reason not to, on the margins, not to plant beans and maybe more corn and a little bit more wheat. Well, it will be interesting to watch. I know it's only, it's a year yeah. away. We're still trying to get this yeah. crop in the ground, but a uh, conversation that we're already having. Appreciate it, Craig. Thanks. We'll be back with more Agnet coming up in just a second. To contact Craig or listen to his podcast, go to turnerstake.com. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. Welcome back to Ag Day here, meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, if we look at the root zone moisture map, you can see there's pretty much a, a lot less blue than there was just a few yeah. weeks ago. I think that's a good way to look at it. Not that we're getting dry in most of those areas, but drier than we were. You can still see, though, places like Pennsylvania, parts of New York, northern Illinois, eastern Iowa, southern portions of Wisconsin, and much of the west still on the wet side. Now, you have to realize this is compared to normal. This is straight from a satellite uh, looking at the moisture in the top levels of the uh, of the soil and so it's still not overly wet out here just wetter than normal uh, and it's typically dry this time of the year in the western portions of this country and taking a look at the uh, weather map for today we do have a system from the northern great lakes 
down toward Kansas City with some showers and thunderstorms along that. This is not going to be a big severe weather maker like we saw a few weeks ago. Don't have to worry about that. Another system in the southeast producing some showers and thunderstorms. That's going to ride up the coast. One over the plains going to move across the Great Lakes, central Mississippi Valley, and that will continue to move east. Area of low pressure in the southwest, kind of typical for this time of the year. Just sitting there, sometimes you'll get afternoon variety showers and thunderstorms, and our model's kind of hinting at that in a couple of spots in the central Rockies. Heading into tomorrow morning, you can see how these two systems kind of coming uh, together here a little bit with some uh, showers and thunderstorms in both places, one in mid-Atlantic, the other one over the Great Lakes and heading through the afternoon hours and uh, they kind of stay separate but nonetheless it's basically going to be wet from the eastern great lakes to new england with scattered activity into the southwest scattered pop-up afternoon activity in the west taking a look at precipitation estimates over the past 24 hours most of it's been in the far southeast Adding in the next 36, you can see that heads up the coast and we see uh, scattered activity along those two systems moving through the middle of the country. 80s in the uh, southeast for the high temperatures today, which is typical, but it's kind of cooler than normal in most areas, including the lows, large area of Kind of upper 40s, lower 50s there over the northern and central plains for tomorrow morning. And uh, tomorrow afternoon, these are cool numbers for this time of the year. Northern Mississippi Valley, Great Lakes, highs only in the 60s. The normal readings in the southeast. All because of this trough digging into the east as we head through the end of this week. Then it kind of flattens out. Becomes a little more zonal, you can see, as we head through next week with a trough finally developing in the west by the middle of next week. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We'll head to Vernal, Utah. First of all, good deal of sunshine and nice today. High of 82. Tulsa, Oklahoma, partly sunny, pleasantly warm. High also around 82. And finally, Huntsville, Alabama, warm with an afternoon storm in a few spots. High of 81. Coming up, Atlantic Salmon without the Atlantic in it. We'll tell you about the engineered version next. Plus, they thought they were getting the new Impossible Whopper, but instead, some people in Brooklyn got the real thing. How that happened, coming up. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. You may soon be able to buy Atlantic salmon that's not from the Atlantic. Massachusetts-based Aqua Bounty says it has begun commercial production of its biotech salmon in Albany, Indiana. The salmon is engineered to grow about twice as fast as conventional salmon, growing to roughly 10 pounds in 16 to 18 months. They also require about 20 to 25 percent less feed. The GM salmon was approved back in 2015, but egg shipments weren't allowed until government officials could work out labeling issues. The import ban was lifted about two months ago, and the company expects the first harvest of the fish in the fall of next year. Customers at a Burger King in Brooklyn got a bit of a surprise. They'd ordered the new Impossible Whopper, which is a plant-based meat substitute sandwich, but instead they got a burger made with real beef. You were probably asking, well, how did that happen? Burger King only offers the Impossible Burgers in select locations, and Brooklyn is not one of them. But according to the menu on one online food delivery service, it is. So Burger King employees filled the orders with beef Whoppers. After the mistake was discovered, the company asked drivers for the food delivery service to inform customers as to what happened, but apparently most customers never learned of the issue, and their receipts read Impossible Whopper. Burger King says the issue has been corrected. It starts with a seed, how one man is being honored for helping to feed millions. Next. In the Country is powered by Kawasaki. Let the good times roll. A seed developer from the Netherlands is this year's recipient of the World Food Prize. Simon Group is a sixth generation seedsman. He's credited with introducing high quality disease resistant vegetable seeds to more than 60 countries, including the Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. Now, Group began his search to create better vegetable seeds to help farmers in Southeast Asia back in 1981. Groot's award was announced at the State Department. He spent much of his life running the East West Seed Company. The remarkable improvements he made to these tropical vegetable seeds helped small farmers in developing nations produce more food and importantly, get more income for themselves and their families, curbing hunger and stimulating economic growth wherever these seeds went. 
The foundation that awards the $250,000 World Food Prize is based in Des Moines, Iowa. Group will receive the prize and award ceremony in October at the Iowa Capitol. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. Spend part of your day with us from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Cliff Griffiths. Have a great day.